appreciate that. My name is Scott Cooper. Uh, I'm with the American National Standards uh, Institute and their VP for Policy and Government Affairs. And I very much appreciate this opportunity, uh, and especially coming after the, the first panel, because uh, what I liked about that was that there was a good give and take, and also, I think, discussing issues in ways about how we get from here to where we, we all, I think, collectively want to be. And um, I know for anybody of a certain age that um, uh, this is, a, I think, that uh, IBR has turned into a little bit like uh, following the Grateful Dead around the country, is that we, I, I recognize so many faces in this audience, and, and many, I think, are going to be up on, this, on the dais when I'm back in the audience. So, but I think this event, because it, it, is, it is targeted toward actual implementation of a public law, that, that kind of focuses the mind. I think we're, we're at a stage now where we can actually talk about the parameters that are necessarily necessary to make this work, I think, in a practical way. And in the discussions that have been going on for the last you know, many, many months, I think that there has been a sense that there are some parameters that we're establishing here, that it's not all an either or an or, but there's some middle ground here. And I think some issues that came out in that first panel are ones that I think are going to be very fruitful for following. So I'm going to be very short. I had a much longer presentation, um, but many of you have heard that already. Uh, but I, I would like to just talk about sort of putting it in, in, in perspective about the public-private partnership, the fact that, uh, that industry, but also uh, standards developers, uh, academics, consumer groups, and, and many, many others, and the government all participate uh, in, in not only the creation of standards and the implementation of standards, but the whole system of how standards fit within um, uh, the U.S. construct of our economy, of, of uh, health and safety issues. And it's somewhat unique, uh, less unique than it has been because I think the rest of the world, especially Europe, is now looking to the U.S. and, and taking our model much more seriously than they have in the past. But I think, again, that public-private partnership, and sometimes it's public-public-private, sometimes it's public-private-private, so you've got a certain amount of continuum there. But it, it's worked very well, uh, and it's not one, unfortunately, that in, ends itself making a nice Gantt chart or when, when some of us uh, go up to the Hill or to agencies you know, sort of it's the valley of death. You have five minutes to get through an explanation of how the U.S. system works, and either you succeed in that five minutes or, you know, the eyes glaze over and you might as well just walk out of the room. And it's about 50-50 sometimes, which, is one, which, it, which, which case it is. But when it does work, people understand. When you get to the point where people start realizing how the U.S. system works and the benefits of that, then, then that's a very fulfilling kind of a situation what makes, I think, our jobs you know, work well. And certainly there, there's, we, we have the documents, I think, that, that under, underscore that, you know, especially uh, uh, OMB Circular A119, which talks about how agencies should recognize the positive contributions of standards development and related activities and all the benefits thereof, you know, uh, increased productivity, efficiency, uh, government industry, expand opportunities for international trade, conserve resources, improve health and safety, protect the environment. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good list and one that I think is uh, very credible. Um, and I think one of the, the best examples of why this all works is, is what the, the Commerce Department does in its oversight effort of tracking agency use of voluntary standards. Um, and in their most recent report, they talk about how in, in the last year uh, that only one agency has, has promulgated a, a government um, standard, government unique standard. Uh, in that same period, uh, federal agencies have, have adopted uh, 363 new voluntary standards. So clearly the trends are, are very good, I think, for that public-private partnership. This also carries through on the international side where on the um, World Trade Agreement, World Trade Organization's agreement on technical barriers to trade, uh, there's, there's an obligation, uh, not just a, re a request or an aspirational goal, but an obligation uh, that where technical regulations are required and relevant international standards exist or their completion is eminent, members, i.e. the nation states, shall use them as the basis for their technical re regulations. So this is a case where private sector standards, or at least consensus standards, are meant to keep people, uh, folks from gaming systems on international trade. And so areas where right now we don't have a lot of, of, of global rulemaking or certainly hard and fast rules, I think standards are proving and, and the private-public private partner, private public partnership is proving to be able to fill that, that void, I think, very effectively. And then going to, I think, the issue at hand here, uh, or certainly from the viewpoint of a lot of people here on the dais, uh, A119 states that it is the policy of the U.S. government to observe and protect the right of copyright holders when incorporating by reference into law voluntary consensus standards. And it goes into a, a, a detail as to, as to why that's important. Um, and it is important because if, if you take away the ability of, of standards developers to control their product, one, losing control means that then, then you, you, you lose the ability to have a pristine document. 
but it also means that the whole flow of, of, uh, of revenue and resources that go into creating those documents is lost. And once you lose it, it's, it's almost impossible to recreate that scene, uh, that, that situation. And, and one of the things about standards is with so much in the, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, approach toward, uh, toward governance is that these are organic um, uh, developers. In other words, um, ASTM goes back to 1905, I think. 1897. 1897, much, much, much earlier than, than, than ANSI, um, which is um, uh, 2000, I'm sorry, uh, 1914, I think, 12, 1912. But these are, these are organizations that have, have grown and, and changed over time. To, to, to recognize differences in, in, in approaches and, and I think to, to be able to stay current to, to the needs. And so if, if suddenly there's a line in the dust or uh, a, a, an approach that, that changes things around so radically as some would, would, would suggest now, I think, for um, incorporation by reference, uh, that's very problematic because we don't know what's on the other side. We, we have our fears. We, we have our concerns as to what that might do to the whole uh, organic approach that we've had, you know, for a hundred years on how standards are developed, uh, and there's certainly there, there are reasons for I think wanting to be able to work with other groups to make sure that we stay we stay current and, and that the, 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 the public policy needs for sta the standards serve continue to to grow and 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 uh, um, and, and uh, evolve. But to say that there is now going to be this this uh, complete change about how standards fit in the system, and I think sort of a cavalier approach will. It'll all work because it's worked for, for the recording industry. It's worked for other, for other organizations. Don't worry. You know, these things just happen. Um, well, they don't just happen. And, the, and, and I think that, that, that many other uh, um, industries would say that, that, that they have not come out looking uh, uh, better because of, of, the, of the situation. That's not to say that there aren't important issues that need to be discussed. And I'm glad, again, that we're having this, this conversation. We're, uh, at ANSI, we were very pleased to work uh, closely with uh, the administrative conference. I'm, I'm glad that Emily's here uh, on their recommendation from uh, their, the December plenary on uh, IBR. And I, I think the important thing there is again that they didn't try to draw lines in the dust either. And they talked about how that their recommendation did not attempt to resolve the questions of copyright law, and rather that the recommendation encourages agencies to take steps to promote the availability of, of incorporated standards, incorporated materials within the framework of existing law. And then they, they then quote uh, the National Science and Technology Council's uh, acknowledgement that the text of standards and associated documents should be available to all interested parties on a reasonable basis, which may include monetary compensation where appropriate. So I think we're, there, there are parameters here we can, we can talk about as opposed to a, the perfect solution. And I think that's part of what I hope this conversation will be about, is that if we can get those parameters in, in such that we can, we can deal with some of the issues that, that were raised in the first panel, and I'd like to get into that just very briefly in a minute, uh, then I think we, we're going to have a very fruitful discussion. But if it ends up being this clash between two polar opposite positions, uh, I don't know. I don't know how that is, is going to serve, uh, you know, public policy needs. And certainly, the public policy needs are important in, uh, in this issue. First of all, I think the problems with, with um, I think the 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 the, the, out, the, out, the outlying uh, ideas here on sort of the standards uh, not only uh, should be made publicly available. Uh, but that standards should lose copyright if they're, if they're, if they're accepted as, as, as incorporated by reference. Uh, and I'll just go through this very quickly, but um, just three issues that immediately come to mind, um, and, and this was brought up again at the first panel, that so many uh, uh, standards that are in incorporated have built within them secondary and tertiary references. Uh, and, and some of these go way down that rabbit hole. You, you have just a tremendous number of, of references built within these standards. So, so to have the standard itself may not get you that far, and Emily, I think, was, made that point very, 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 very well, is that you need some other, you know, uh, explications, and that may be part of the discussion, I think, that, that we, we all could very productively have, because if you just have a document, and, and having seen a lot of these, um, it, is, it is not readily usable. It is not user-friendly, and certainly not, I think, to even to the informed public, if what they're trying to do is um, use that standard to make decisions, public policy decisions on, on, on uh, issues of, you know, health and safety. Um, and so I think the idea that, that somehow if we can talk about what, what other documents and, and what other uh, ways of developing transparency within, within the incorporation by reference system, uh, that would be, I think, a very useful discussion. And it's one that I hope that we, we can have, if not part of this discussion, that, then further down the road, because we will have, no doubt, we will all see each other in, in further events uh, as well. 
Just an example of, of the secondary and tertiary references, uh, the National Fire Protection Association uh, and their NFPA 101, which is their life safety code, uh, has within it uh, references to 69 other NFPA documents, uh, standards, as well as 45 other standards from six other standards developers. And so within those, those standards, uh, and I, I didn't go much further than this, inevitably there's going to be references to other standards. Well, how is that going to be useful to anybody when they see this document? They can even do that, the, the, the four-page standard that we talked about in the, in the first panel. That four-page standard may have multiple references built within it. You know? And so just having the standard available is not, I think, the solution if we're talking about public policy concerns. But that doesn't mean that, that the whole idea of transparency can't be part of that discussion. Secondly, many of the standards under, under IBR rules are international standards. Uh, such as those promulgated by ISO and IEC, uh, both based in Geneva, Switzerland. Any changes to current regulations regarding IBR uh, would have no jurisdictional effect on the current sales and distribution uh, practices of ISO and IEC. So I'm not too sure we, we can, in a sense, sort of, you know, call up the spirits, but I'm not too sure we can actually make some of these things exactly happen. Uh, and, and third, uh, and this I know has been a, been a concern for DOT, is, is that agency budgets would be significantly impacted, significantly impacted if they had to undertake the responsibility of buying site licenses or making standards available in a downloadable format uh, for free to, to citizens. Um, and I don't think that's a, I don't think anybody has really parsed that out, or if they have, I, I've not heard it, how that is, would work if, even if you tried to do it. And it, 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 I think an equally um, uh, worrisome question is if you have, if you go that route, if you have the government suddenly acting as a, as a monopoly purchaser, what's that going to do to the ecology of how standards are created? Uh, suddenly you have, you, you've changed around how, how, how the, the world utilizes standards. You, you remove those who actually are, are those who need these standards for the, for the dailiness of their, of their business or, the, or their life and put it all back, back on the government. It seems like that's the wrong way to go. And again, there, there should be a discussion, I think, about, about how we make this all work for everybody. But I think the idea that having, having sort of these, these, these simple solutions, because usually every simple solution to a complex problem is, is a wrong one. Uh, but, but I think the discussion, I think, is, is one that, that uh, makes a lot of sense. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish very quickly here. Um, I think that there is room for, for a lot of a very useful discussion am among those um, uh, in this room, and I think those who are hopefully listening, as well as to how we, we make IBR work in better ways um, for uh, public policy needs. But that, that is not, again, the draconian solution of eliminating copyright. I think that is, that is just the wrong approach. I think there's a lot of things that can be done in transparency, there are a lot of things that can be done on a better explication of standards, the way that, that Emily described. Um, my last example on that would be uh, the Government Printing Office has a top 10, uh, top 25 list of, of documents that it sells. One of those is a document put out by the uh, uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission on lead abatement. And it's, it's not an expensive pamphlet, it's like $2, I think. But here they have, they are sitting on a, a whole series of standards, a whole series of, 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 of rulemakings, and as well as, as public law on lead abatement, uh, going back to, to, you know, for decades. And yet they see the need to make, make lead abatement solutions available to the public to put out a document, you know, based upon, you know, publicly available documents, and, and based upon uh, the work of, of, of the resources of, of the CPSC staff, and they're charging for it. Not much, but they're charging for it. So I think there's many approaches that, 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 that are all legitimate going forward on these things. We don't have to have a one-size-fits-all, because that's probably going to be a, a, the, the wrong solution. But if CPSC can sell a lead abatement pamphlet for $2, and it's a best bestseller for GPO, it seems like there's room for a lot of discussion, a lot of, a lot of solutions that may work in some cases and not in others, but I think we need to have that kind of discussion, and I'm, I'm hoping that this is one of, one of the, the places we can have that. So thank you. Thank you, Scott.